Welcome to the Everyday Miracles Podcast, where real-life stories of hope and inspiration are shared. Every day, miracles are happening all around us, yet we rarely hear anything about them. Why is that? I'm Julie Hedenborg, and I've committed my time and energy to bring these stories to you, including some of my own personal experiences. My hope is that you'll be impacted the same way that I was. Join me in my journey to inspire change in a world that so desperately needs it. Welcome back to Everyday Miracles Podcast. I'm Julie Hedenborg, your host, and I have something very powerful for you today, as I always do. Um, In these days, um, there's a lot of people that might be feeling like Joseph in the pit, or maybe even like Job, God forbid. Um, I have a message, a guest here today that is going to really inspire you. He's been through so much and um, I'm just honored to have him here today. So a little bit about my guest, he's out of Pennsylvania. Um, He was a former youth pastor for many, many years. He's passionate about um, helping others and um, the youth was a big part of what he did before. Um, Chuck Carr is his name. He has influenced hundreds of people, although I think that's more now, Chuck, because you have several books. Um, He desires to help others live effectively despite hardships, as his testimony proves that sufferings can be changed into blessings. Losing a spouse in 2008, he strives to help those hurting from the same pain. A life-altering accident in 2018 uh, left him with a traumatic brain injury, and his vision and life goal has been refocused to help others heal from devastating traumas. He's now remarried to a woman of the sh- who has the sh- same shared life goals, and he's chosen to live with purpose despite his injuries, and he is an inspiration to others. So Chuck Carr, welcome today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm can happy. you? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm happy for this. I'm thrilled for the chance. So thank you. Yes, and I know I'd love for you to start with sharing a little bit about how you your upbringing, because it's very beautiful um, how you grew up. Well, I grew up in a Christian home. I was fortunate enough to have that privilege and opportunity. And most of the time when I do podcasts or, or speak, I, I like to do little two cents in for my parents because they formed and shaped, shaped me. And uh, my dad was in the church choir. I learned how to worship because of him. And my mom would sit us down at the kitchen table Saturday mornings and put a Bible in front of us and said, read out loud. <laughs> and so we learned how to read. And, and I'm very, very fortunate that those types of things happened uh, because it kind of gave me the, the fuel to be able to take things myself. And sooner or later, your parents' faith is not going to work for you anymore. You have to make your own choices and your own decisions. And I had just enough boost from them and seeing the way that they lived and seeing how they wanted to raise me that uh, I, I took off from there. And more than that, also being out on the farm, uh, I, I grew up on a dairy farm and just being out and about in, in all God's creation, Romans tells us about clearly the things that God has made is evidence and, and proof to his existence. And being out on a tractor in the hills and, and the rolling hills of Pennsylvania, it's beautiful up here. And you could, I could see God everywhere. And, and I learned to worship and praise him on a tractor and sing in the hills and kind of feel like David a little bit, uh, where I would, I would go on a quad ride, go up on top of the hill and tell God the things that I needed. And those experiences really set the stage and the foundation for my faith. Otherwise, later on in life, I, I don't know if I would have made it uh, going through some hard things. If I wouldn't have had that sure foundation, I would have been a casualty of war most likely. So, yeah. Well, and I'm excited for, well, I'm not excited about what you went through because it was horrible, but I, I want people to hear uh, the ways you were tested. It's, it's really, it's really amazing that you did stay with your faith. 
Well, like I said, I was a youth pastor. I, I believe I started teaching in 1997. It might have been 98. And I was going to college at the time. So the same youth group that I had been a part of in high school, I wanted to stay on board and contribute. And at the time there was a youth pastor, but he was leaving and I kind of got handed the youth group, whether I wanted it or not. And, but of course I did and I, and I craved it. I, I craved purpose and, and to be able to use my passion and share what I knew about the Lord with other teenagers and help get them on the right path. And so I taught from, I believe about 1997, 1998 on, I taught for 12 years and amazing being able to influence and mold and shape teenagers. I loved it. It was, it was incredible. Uh, I got married in 2000 and Becca was my sweetheart and she was on board with it not so much at first, but it, it grew on her and she developed a love and passion for uh, for the girls in the group. Uh, thank you. That uh, really is even lasting to this day. I, I still get comments now and then from some of the teenagers that we had clear back in the 90s that what we what we did and spoke and the time we put in and the efforts that we put in really made a lasting difference. And so things were going well. We were, we were in the groove. We were ministering. We were the poster children of, of the church, I guess you could say, growing up in that church. It was, we were the product of, of what a church would be able to produce and turn around and put back into itself and things were really 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 running smoothly and we had two boys uh, Bradley was born in 2002 Justin was born in 2005 and then it all started to go haywire and I don't know how else to say it but I I was living the dream and one day the dream came crashing down and I can remember very vividly, it was our Valentine's day dinner. And uh, we were out at a Mexican restaurant and things didn't go well for the Mexican restaurant. So when something first happens medically health wise, uh, you get passed from one doctor to another doctor. It starts out acid reflux and take this pill and do this. And, and sooner or later, there we were, it was 2006 with a stomach cancer diagnosis. And a young married couple who was living the dream deep in ministry doing everything we thought was right and true and good to have this diagnosis. We fully believed that God was going to pull us through. We, we felt like it was a hiccup and a scary hiccup, but one that he was going to see us through. We, we had more to do in life. We had we have more people to minister to, more people to teach, more people to love on, boys to raise, and that's not how it happened. And 2008, she passed, and that was an enormous strike to my faith as a, as a youth pastor. I'm supposed to know all the answers. I'm supposed to know the whys and the hows and the, and the deep questions that other people have that they come to you and here I am with as little or less of an answer to tell anybody than than what they would come to me and 
you would think that that's where it would stop, but it, it didn't stop. Uh, shortly after that, our church had a tremendously difficult split and uh, not to say too much about the ins and the outs of that that ordeal, but I I was no longer going to be youth pastor anymore, and that was uh, very hard on the kids that I had taught for so many years, and the and the and the bonds and the connections and. And to have a, a church split and a strike go down through the congregation and and things beyond our control as far as, as I go, you know, I had very little control over what happened with the leadership of the church. So here I am with without a wife in 2008 and shortly after without a ministry and that was a double whammy that left me with even more questions. I, I have to say there was a, a lot of anger involved, a lot of soul searching. And I don't know that God would have given me the answer at once, even if I would pleaded all night with him. I think that it was... Uh, a developing answer that I had to grow into. I don't think that I was ready for it right there. When you, when your heart's ripped open and, and bleeding, uh, band-aids don't really do much good. And it took the pressing in of the, of the Lord and, and my faith and his love and grace really for many years for me to be able to piece together some of the things that happened. Yeah, in your book, um, one of the books that you've written, because you've written many, you have a lot, God's put a lot on your heart. I thought it was very beautiful how you you shared very vulnerably in your book, um, one of them, and we'll get to that, but um, it was really touching. It's going to inspire people that read that. I shared some of the hardships, and, you know, I know we only have an hour, but one of the things that really was brought back to my attention I'm talking with you because I have memory issues and <laughs> sometimes I forget what I even have written in my book and I'll read through my book and I'm like whoa that's pretty cool <laughs> glad I put that in there but when you, and we'll get into my memory issues later in this broadcast but uh there's a tremendous amount of pressure on the sick person that needs healed. And I don't know why this occurs in our country, but it does. And I addressed it in the book. So if you are a hurting person out there, a, a, someone suffering from a sickness, a chronic, chronic, chronic sickness, and you feel the pressure of others trying to say, well, name it and claim it, or if you just believe, or if you just have enough faith, you can be healed, or just start acting like you're healed and, it, and it's going to happen. Those kinds of things are so damaging for the, for the chronically ill person. And <clears throat> I don't know if it's just an easy out for the, for the passerby who doesn't want to spend their night on their face in prayer for the sick person or if it's just a cliche or something we don't know what to say we feel uncomfortable about that person um we feel guilty maybe that we're healthy and they're not i i, I don't know but if you're one of those people get my book and soak that portion of it up because i feel your pain my my wife that passed away felt your pain and there's a good bit of info in that book that would help somebody like that out <clears throat> thank you for that I, I think this is something that's heavy on the lord's heart because it's the second time that's come up recently and i have had someone else that 
that named it and claimed it and got their healing. And maybe in their heart, they just feel like everyone just has, they just want it for other people, but God's ways are different than our ways. God's ways are different. God's yeah. ways are higher than our ways. Yeah. And I hear you on that. I, um, I don't know if you know, I have a spine and I don't want to make it about me too much, but I can relate to that. And I have actually been in a healing conference, even recently in tears, because someone's trying, looking at me saying, well, you don't have enough faith. It's like, oh, you have no idea. I know God can heal me. Trust you me. Know? And it, 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 can, it can hurt. Faith. If it was up to my faith, my, my first wife would still be living and breathing today. It, it was God's ways are higher than our ways. And we do not understand everything that he does. So mm -hmm. But anyhow, a after the church split, and, and I'm kind of on my road to recovery, I have two boys, <laughs> I'm raising two boys, and I'm a dairy farmer. So you know how somebody will walk in your house, leave the door open, you turn and you look and you say, well, were you raised in a barn? You know, I don't know if any of you have ever heard something like that. Well, my kids were literally raised in a barn. And I put Justin to sleep for his afternoon nap many days on the seat of a truck or, a, you know, the floor of the parlor on a couch cushion in the milking parlor. I had to work and I had to raise them and that's how it went. And we took lots of snacks to work. He was on a tractor, cab tractor. You know, I went always safe that he doesn't, nobody falls out or anything and the glass of the tractor keeps him safe but he would sleep on the floor of the tractor or the floor of a, of a it was crazy it was crazy for a long time but I have a great support community around me that made sure that they were going to see me through and see my boys through and things started looking good again and I needed time i needed time to process the losses in my life and uh, i don't think i could have picked a better place to do that than the same hills and countryside that i had grown up singing worship songs when i ride a quad and the lord was healing me the lord was mending things back together the lord was doing good things and and then another whopper happened in 2018 I was, I was at work and don't need to go into too much detail for sake of time, but I got hit in the forehead and fractured my skull in two places, instantly lost the hearing in my left ear, um, had vertigo so bad that I, I couldn't get out of the way after I woke up crawling on the ground and it, it was, it was one of those things where like, you get hurt on the playground, you stand up and you feel like you're ready to go right back in the game. <laughs> and when I finally got my bearings enough to crawl to a place where I could sit up and the white lights had stopped by then and I still had the crazy ringing in my head, ringing in my ear, but I got to the place where I was like, you know, I'm going to dust myself off and, and go back to work. I, I've been hurt at work before and I was able to just regroup and go back and continue. And, and I, it wasn't even that I had pain at first. I don't think I did. I think it was, uh, the body has the ability to initially shut things like that off. And, and the longer I sat there, the more it hurt and the more it hurt, the harder it was to breathe. And pretty soon I, we were calling an ambulance and I kept blacking in and out and I couldn't stay awake. And when they came in and bless their hearts, it, it was a, it's a dairy barn and the floor was <laughs> messy as you can imagine. And they rushed in and never blinked an eye, never heard one complaint. And I wish I could shake their hands. I don't know who they were, but 
they put me on a stretcher and put a collar on me. And when they moved me about, I don't know, maybe a foot, 10 inches a foot, just a little bit, the motion was so bad I threw up. And I heard the lead paramedic say, well, he just threw up blood. He just threw up pure blood, I heard him say. And I figured that I need to say my prayers and figured I was on my way out. And it was, it was one of those points in your life that's unlike any other. I, I can't compare it to anything. I can't justifiably describe it probably, but as a believer, knowing where I was going, my eyes were already closed and I had a peace come over me unlike any other peace I have ever experienced in my life. And the peace just washed over me and nothing else existed. And I told the Lord, I said, Lord, please receive my spirit. And I had my eyes closed. I fully expected to wake up in glory. And I was okay with that. And you would think in that spot, I would be thinking about what haven't I gotten to yet in life? Or what do I still need to take care of before I'm ushered into glory? Nope none of that occurred and I was ready and I was expecting and I was very overjoyed to wake up in glory and instead <laughs> I woke up in Forbes trauma center not in glory <laughs> in <Yeah>. agony <laughs> and I loved how you talked you felt the presence of the Lord clearly I felt the presence of the Lord and it was wonderful it was the peace that passes all understanding. I lived and breathed it. And so I guess when my time does come and it is the time for me to go to glory, I have something very sweet to look forward to. So, mm -hmm. but anyhow, I kept waking back up in and out, in and out. And the pain was so tremendous at that point. I can remember them sewing my forehead back together and the pinprick of the needle and the feel of the thread going through my skin was so reassuring. And so it, it was something else to think about, something else to focus on. And it was so invited. I, and, and then I blacked out again, but it wasn't easy and and to have all these things happen in boy it would have been about 15 years 15 years from my wife's first diagnosis to getting hit on the head it, that's a lot that's a lot for one person to to handle in 15 years and now I was at a place where I don't even have my health. I, I was sitting, sitting in a chair for over 23 hours a day, you know, needing help, not being able to take care of myself. Or your boys. Or my boys. And they were old enough by then that they could make something to eat and, and do things like that. So physically we were still fine, but emotionally and psychologically we were not fine. And the same dad who would kayak the ocean in Maine and go to Assateague and camp on the beach with wild ponies, you know, all those kinds of things, instantly all that was taken away from them. And dad was on a couch and at first I think the initial like we're glad dad is still alive um, they would sit on the couch 
keep me company. But you can't keep a teenager on a couch very long. And, and sooner or later, out the door, they would go on their own wild adventures again. And I started to get incredibly lonely. And it was a double-edged sword for a lot of reasons. But one, I was alone and I couldn't physically get up and go to the presence of another person. But two, when someone would come to visit me, I couldn't handle them being in the room. And even the most closest people to me would come over to visit and I would almost wish them away in my head because I couldn't handle the stimulus of, of people coming in and interacting with me. Somebody who has a brain injury that's in that spot, especially at first, they almost require silence and no visual stimulation for a long time. So yeah. I became lonelier than I've ever been. <clears throat> and, you know, you're in a house, in a chair <laughs> for 23 hours, your yeah. mind starts to go crazy. And you also had double vision for a long time and you had this ringing in your ears. So there's, there's a lot more physically, this wasn't just recovering from stitches. Like you had a lot yeah. of things happening in your body. I, uh, some of the things are kind of funny. Like I would close my eyes. I, I would see one boy on that couch and one boy on this couch, close my eyes and they would switch without me knowing. Well, I didn't know that you can't locate sound with only one ear. So I would hear them talking, just assuming that they're still in the same place. And you open your eyes and the room is different. They might not even be in the room anymore. You know, it's kind of funny now, but it wasn't funny then. Mm -hmm. Or like the remote falls off the couch and you hear it hit the floor and you reach to the wrong side of the couch. Or you're sitting in your couch and someone knocks on the door and you look to the door and it's the wrong door and somebody walks in the other door. Just, you can't locate sound without two ears. It, but I was on heavy medications too and I can remember looking over and well there's a there's a fuzzy little rat right there and I was so happy that a fuzzy little rat had come to keep me company <laughs> you know it was crazy it was crazy for a long time and my memory was so gone that I, w I wasn't supposed to take a shower they didn't they didn't allow me to take a shower or want me to take a shower because of balance issues but the one day I was making it up the steps and I was grungy enough that I was going to take a shower and <laughs> whether anybody wanted it or not. And, and I can remember the water hitting me on the back, standing in the shower and totally and completely forgot where I was or what I was doing with shower water running on me. So that's that gives you a little bit better of an idea of, of where we were and kids, it was hard on, I think it was harder on other people than it was on me because I can shut the sound off the TV and just watch it. I can, you know, have somebody close the door and just recover, but there was never recover for everybody else. It was dad's on a couch and our lives have changed now. And that was very, very hard. And I think that aspect of it was enough to put me into a depression like I've never been in before, where I have lost my health. I have lost all capability really to take care of myself. And now my kids, who I had to take care of largely myself for all those years, I can't even be part of their life anymore as as I can, but not in the same, the same sense. And I spiraled into a depression that uh, hopefully I can at least turn around and help other people that are facing something like that. Uh, very, very, very dark place. 
and place I'd never wish to return to again, a lonelier place than I've ever been in. And depression is not a fun thing. I, I joke sometimes, I, I describe it, because I'm an author, I like to describe with metaphors and imagery, but I love to sail, used to, love to be on the sea, uh, walk around my house, you see all my nautical stuff everywhere. And those who live on the sea and know about the sea also know the mermaids that come and they don't come their true selves. And a, a pirate or a, or a seaman that looks over the edge of his ship and sees the, sees the mermaid coming in slowly and gracefully and beautifully, that's not the mermaid's true self. And neither are the temptations that people have to cope with stuff like this. And I was faced with temptations to cope. And some of them I took, some of them I didn't take but they never are, they never come through the way that you see them at first. Their promises are in vain. And you're out on the sea and you see the mermaids coming. You need to, you need to set sail the other direction as fast as you can. Yeah. Because none of them will help. Anyhow, fast forward. I got a book from Johnny Erickson Tata came in the mail. And by this point, I was just starting to be able to read. My eyes were agreeing with each other enough that I could finally turn pages and at least do something in my couch. And I, and I read a book. And of course, some people, some of you know that she was paralyzed in a, in a swimming accident. Mm -hmm. And I sponged everything she said. I couldn't believe someone else out there knew exactly the way that I felt. And the depression she felt, I felt. And the heartache she felt, I felt. The guilt that she felt, I felt. I felt it all. And I, I read through her book very quickly and it just grabbed hold of my heart. And I finished the book and I'm like, God, if you can do that with her, you can do that with me. And that was a turning point in my life that I started to say, you know what? I've had all these bad things happen to me. Am I gonna let that dictate my life? Am I gonna let that drive me in one direction or am I gonna turn around and am I gonna do something good with it all? And Romans 8, 28, we all know that verse, uh, but I am a living testament to that verse. I'm living testament that that verse is absolutely true. For we know that God works all things together for good for those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose. It's not a maybe. It's a definite statement. It's a of course statement that God can do that. And when I really started to look at that verse and allow God to work that verse in my life, everything changed. And that's the good part of my story. That's people get tired of hearing the pain and the, and the, we, we want, we want the, where's the part where I can latch hold and take inspiration from your story in? And Romans 8.28 is it. And I wrote a book. Well, let me back up. Uh, I met a woman who I knew from our old church. And the ways of God and the ways of love are a magnificent thing. And I have to say that my wife, Ferry, my current wife, Ferry, is just a breath of fresh air to me in the sense that God led me to somebody who is the exact person that I needed to fuel 
and drive and help and shape and inspire me to this new chapter of my life. And she's a go-getter and she's uh, very much an inspiration. And she had seen some of my love letters to her. She had seen and read and understand the parts of me that nobody else can see. She's like, you've got to be writing. And after a while, it start, started to dawn on me, well, maybe I, maybe I should. And I had a very good moment with the Lord. And I can remember sitting on the couch because I was there all the day, all day long. And I said, Lord, if you want me to write a book, I want you to give me the story. And in 10 minutes, I kid you not, in 10 minutes, I had the entire plot and storyline of the book done. And I got a computer, I got a new computer, and I started to write. And it only took about a month. And my first book, The Convergence, was done cover to cover in a month. And that started it all. And I went on to write a a little snippet of a booklet, self-help booklet. Then I read, uh, sorry, wrote all the locusts can, all that the locusts have eaten. You've got a copy of it there. Uh, that's my memoir and my testimony. I I started a, a blog. I have a web page. It's chuck-car.com. My name with a hyphen in between. And my eyes really got opened at that point because I couldn't believe the hits that were coming up. I couldn't believe that somebody from Brazil or France or China or India, these places that are so far from anything that I could have ever imagined reaching, here I am reaching people on the other side of the planet, people I'll never see, never, never know, but something that God did in me and sparked in me is now affecting somebody else. And especially when I saw the hits from China that really grabbed me like none of the other ones um, because I saw that there most likely was a real risk for that person to be on my website. Um, and you know that China is a, is a hot spot for persecuted Christianity and and to see that there were not one, but many people in China on my website just humbled me and broke me and fueled me. And so these things all kind of just gradually kept moving in a steady progression. And, I, and it dawned on me, like, I used to be ministering to... 20 or, or 30 precious teenagers and was devastated when that ministry was taken from me. Now I'm reaching people in China and Bolivia and all these nations I didn't even know there were English speaking people in. Now I'm writing books that I have thousands of copies in people's hands where people hear my testimony and are inspired. And, and I, I packaged a lot of that all together in, in the book that you held up, All That the Locusts Have Eaten, because that's exactly the way that I felt like my life was. It was beautiful. The locust swarm came in, stripped everything, ate everything, left me for bear. But God doesn't leave you like that. And uh, if my message to everybody, if I could scream one message out to, to the hurting community that's listening to this podcast is God will not leave you there. Be faithful to God. God will be faithful to you. I have a verse uh, let me see if I can switch this and read it. Ephesians 3.20 is a very, very, very special verse to me and my wife. Uh, we've 
read it many times, it says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. One version says, imagine, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And, you know, if you are somebody who was in my spot of hurt or pain or hardship, how big is your imagination? Because God can do far and above anything that you could have asked or imagined. If you would have said to me, even two or three years ago, would you have a book in thousands of people's hands right now? I'd say, you're off your rocker. <laughs> but God is good. I have a beautiful wife who loves me very much. You still have scars and the pain of, of the past, but God can heal and he can restore what the locust has eaten. He can restore what the canker worm has, has devoured. And a bloom can occur even in the driest desert. And, and that's what's happened to me. Romans 8.28 is absolutely a rock solid, rock solid verse. I probably talk too much. Is there no, no it's great. You're, you're awesome. No, I get excited. Well, number one, um, the fact that you survived, you know, that you go into a lot more detail in your memoir. And um, as a nurse, I love all the details. So um, the fact that you even survived this is pretty miraculous. And I know you didn't go into detail, but I'm sure there were, there were not good reports that were in that with all of what you went through, um, with your head injury and reading how long you suffered with, you can even open your eyes. I mean, it was just the sound and the, the, the vision and all the things that were happening to you. It's just, it's unimaginable, you know, and, and also the fact that obviously I'm big on testimonies, right? So her testimony Jane, touched you so powerfully. Look how God used the power of a testimony, whether you're on a podcast or you're at the grocery store or wherever you are, like God can use your, your testimony in a moment to change someone's life and work mm -hmm. through it. And I'm, I'm humbled that, and I feel like I can relate to you. I, you know, I am actually considered disabled at home redirected is the term I like to use. I never thought I would be doing this. And I've seen people in China also, you know, hearing some of these things and it just, I cry. It's like, mm -hmm. I cannot believe what God is doing here. I was, I thought my life was over, you know, and this was my whole identity. And now look what God is doing with something that I could have never imagined. So I love your story. And I'm just, I'm so happy that um, you, you got that testimony and that you, you've started writing, you know, I bet the doctors, when you were, had your head injury, you know, probably didn't look at you and think, well, this is a guy who should be writing. <laughs> you know, it's going to affect thousands, uh, you know? So of, like you said, Ephesians three twenty, one one of my favorite verses also, um, God can use you. And I, I've heard of other people saying, you know, they felt called to write and they sat down and everything just came and it's just amazing what God can do. Um, how are you now? Like, are you able to walk? Are you, how, what are your conditions oh. now? Well, it's a, it's an uphill battle. Um, I can walk. I, I can even drive right now. I can, mm -hmm. I can do a lot of things that I didn't expect that I would be able to do, but I also have I'm in a place right now where everything about me looks normal from the outside. You can't see any scars or anything, but that's not right on the inside. And so that's a challenge because somebody walks up to me and says something on my left side. Well, I can't hear. I look like I can, but I can't. Or somebody walks up to me and sees that I'm walking around and expects me to be able to do something for them and I, and I can't and it's a challenge to look like a healthy person but not be and it's a challenge for my family to deal with someone who forgets a lot it's a challenge for my family who 
expects me to remember some appointments or engagements and expects me to hear when they yell something up the steps and it comes with its own set of challenges. I, I still have issues with stimuli and when teenagers are being crazy and, you know, sometimes I have to go sit in a quiet room a lot. Um, but I'm alive mm -hmm. and I'm here and I'm, I'm okay with me being like this for God's glory. And it's a, it's a very sweet spot to know that you were very close to not being here and here I am and I can walk. And so I, I'm thankful. I, of course I have days where I'm frustrated that I can't go kayak anymore and those kinds of things, but I've had a lot of help from, I, I had a brain psychologist, one specialized in brain injuries just to, help teach us how to cope with things. And one of the biggest suggestions she had is, you know, you're, you have a bucket and in your bucket is full of kayaking and, and riding your dirt bike and all these things that you can't do anymore. You need a new bucket. Don't think about that bucket anymore. Get a new bucket and fill it clear full with things that you can do and so I did, and I, I put things in it, like going out to eat with our teenagers, watching a movie, um, you know, things that were feasible, and that helps take a lot of the guilt and the mental strain off of a parent that you, you yeah, yeah, get away from a bucket of things I can't do, you know, and yeah let's have family night. Let's pull something up out of the bucket that we can do and enjoy. And, and the other thing that I've learned is that quality is much better than quantity and trying to spend all day doing something, wearing myself out, spinning myself into confusion or getting irritated that, that I'm trying to do too much. Just stop go to my room, shut the door, recharge, come back a few hours later and have good quality time with those that you love instead of trying to hammer through your whole day and, and accomplishing little. So yeah, that helps too. That's awesome. And you know, um, I want to say something for those people that are maybe waiting for their healing. You know, I know God will heal both of us. It might be on the other side of heaven. Um, I know he can, and some days my prayer changes a little bit to, you know what, even if not, like, I know there's a purpose for this and just Lord, make it count. And, um, a friend of mine who, um, I have a severe spine issue and, uh, she shared something and I, I feel like I want to read it and I've got to get her permission before I air this. Um, but she helped me to see my condition in a different light. And I feel like this could bless someone, um, Oh, how many of us with spinal issues that think our spines are hidden from God and that we are struggling with this all by ourselves. Do you really think that God of the universe is oblivious to the struggles that you face with your body? Just because God has chosen to not miraculously heal your body yet and give you a straight spine doesn't mean he doesn't love you. Actually, the opposite seems to be the case for me on days when my spine hurts, I find the rest peace and love that the Lord gives me to be such a blessed gift. I'm forced to lie down, give my spine a break, breathe and be still in that stillness is when I can so beautifully feel the presence of the Lord. I wonder if I wasn't forced to pause in my busy life, if I would voluntarily search out those blessed quiet moments with God. Um, so, um, that really gave me a different perspective. Um, you know, maybe there's a purpose, um, and all of this, maybe we're, our faith is getting stronger in some way and we're feeling the presence of God in a different way because we have this. So, um, just something for somebody out there. So, um, 
sorry, I got so emotional. So, um, let me, I know you obviously have dealt with grief and, you know, being a nurse and studied Kubler-Ross and all these things. I realized I know nothing about grief, you know, doing this podcast, speaking to people who have had such traumatic losses, you have a book that you've written. And I feel like that was one of the books that people, if you're dealing with grief, yes. Wonders in the deep. Can you just say a, a little bit about each of your books and who they might be for? Well, sure. Um, I'm creative. <laughs> I'm a creative author. I can write about the nuts and bolts of things. And even in my memoir, I, I couldn't hardly do that very long. I had to get into illustrations and metaphors and, and really things that kind of pry the creative side of me out of my head and onto a page. But this one, I, I went full bore on. It's the whole book is a metaphor and an illustration, a fictional story that shows what I have learned about grief and compiled it all into one package to show somebody who's hurting from grief that, that you can come out the other side and you can do it well. And it's a very, very enlightening story. It, I, I'll kid you not, it has hard parts but that's the reality of life. And uh, someone who's struggling from hurt or loss, grieving, this book would be a perfect fiction read for you because you can pull from it different parts. There's enough metaphor, enough, enough eluding to things throughout the book that you can grab hold of what you need and God can speak to you what he wants. And it would be a perfect read for someone who just needs uh, healing. And it's pretty much uh, parts of my story put together in a fiction read. But I also have a self-help book. I, I don't have it in front of me, but it's titled Navigating Grief. I don't think I do. Oh, yeah, I do. Navigating grief, 10 steps, 10 simple tips to overcome loss. It is, if you don't have a lot of time to read, if you need uh, healing like a grocery list where you just write down the 10 things you need, this book would be a perfect short read for someone who just needs simple practical help and you are not a, a book nut. The Convergence, I'm, I mentioned that earlier. This book actually got two awards. Uh, it was, this is the book that I put together in 10 minutes and it got two, two awards for self-published books. I was really, really happy about that. Um, it's a book that helps people with grief and loss. And the most recent thing that I did is just a short little book called Captain's Log. This is after you read Wonders in the Deep that has so much illustrations that could mean different things to different people. Get a copy of this. And as you can see, there's a lot of blanks. And I ask a lot of heart to heart questions in this book scripture really speaks it takes the messages of wonders in the deep and attaches them to scriptures so that it can actually meet the reader on the home front and anybody who reads through wonders in the deep i made it cheap it's only five bucks on amazon i didn't want cost to limit anybody from getting it. I don't even care if I make money on that book. It's just, I want people to take the messages from Wonders in the Deep and actually apply them. And that's what th that book is. It'd be great for book club discussions or just something that you read 10 minutes before you go to bed each night and reflect. Uh, but I'd highly encourage that book. And you can find all my books on Amazon or you can check out my website chuckcar.com chuck-car.com i'm also on facebook and instagram you can find me those ways too awesome and last thing i'd love for you to do if you would um um 
I would love for you to pray over the listeners um, that are feeling that like they're in their pit right now, like Joseph, um, they're feeling alone or frustrated or um, angry. Um, and then those two with church hurt that have been through, I know there's so many people, sadly, that I meet through this podcast, um, that are just, they've turned away from their church. So, um, if we could pray for those people. Sure. Heavenly father, I lift up those hurting people right now. It's not just in Pennsylvania. It's not just in the United States. People globally, Lord have church hurt. People have been really wounded by the very people that they have looked up to for spiritual guidance and leadership. People have been hurt in the politics of church when politics shouldn't even exist. Lord God, people have been hurt from loss, grief, wounded from health loss, where they're they're in that same pit that I was in before, a pit of despair, a pit that You don't know which way is up, possibly like Joseph looking up through prison bars, reaching up to the sky saying, God, where are you? I pray, Lord, that you would touch each one of those people right now that's listening along, that you would touch them in the same way that you quieted my heart, telling me that you are right there with us, And Lord, in your time and in your walk and in the journey, heal, help, provide answers. Lord, you don't do it all at once. That'd be like a Band-Aid over a mega gash. But Lord, you take your time where you stitch things delicately and perfectly so that they can grow and heal in its perfect way. I pray for patience and I pray for strength for these people. And ask that you would touch them with your Holy Spirit, even right now, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> amen. That was beautiful. I love seeing all the books uh, and what God is doing through you. It's really amazing, even with what you've had. Like, it's beautiful. So I hope you guys check out Chuck Carr. Again, that was www.chuck dash or hyphen. Can you say it one more time? <laughs> C-H-U-C-K hyphen C-A-R-R dot com. Yes. Check out every, he's got so much there for you. If you're going through any of these things, I think it'll really lift you up. So thanks so much for sharing this personal story with me. And and we just praise God for what he's doing through you. And uh, if you have a miracle that you would like to share with me, please reach out to me at everydaymiraclespodcast.com. We have a new website. And uh, actually it's not new by the time this airs, I have so many testimonies right now, but um, you can contact me through there um, if you would like to come on the show and be a guest and share and give God the glory with me together. Thanks so much. God bless. Thank you. God bless.